Turn in your Bibles to the Gospel by John, chapter 1. That's where we're going to read in just a moment. But before we read there, I'd like to share with you in this concluding message, this is the sixth of our series going through creation, and I'd like to share with you that this morning, we as a church are creationists. And I want you to think about the implications of that because everything that we believe as believers, as Christians, as born-again followers of Jesus Christ, determines our behavior. Now, not only are we creationists, which I'm talking about this morning, but we're, before that, inerrantists. We believe in the inerrancy of this book. We believe that this book is the absolutely perfect, flawless, like silver refined in a furnace seven times, Word of God. Why do we believe that? Well, if you're not an inerrantist, then the Bible has errors in it. And errors are kind of like uh, when I was little, and when you were little, do you remember how your mother would say, don't pull that string in your sweater? Well, we all did it. You know, when she wasn't looking, we pulled it. And pretty soon it starts unraveling and your sweater falls apart. And as soon as you uh, believe that there are historical errors, scientific errors, theological errors... Uh, philosophical errors, then which part of the Bible can you trust? And it starts unraveling. See, God presented this as the absolutely flawless, inerrant, in part, infallible, in total. That means in totality, it cannot be controverted, and in every single part there is no error That's how God presents it. So we are inerrantists. We're also cessationists. You say, what is that? A cessationist means that there isn't any more Bible coming. We believe the Bible has ceased in its revelation coming from God. There is no extra letter that someone is going to write in the future to add to this. And there aren't any missing letters that someone wrote since the close of the apostolic period. And there are no living apostles and prophets that are still mouthpieces giving the absolute inerrant revelation of God. So you say, so? Well, there are people that aren't cessationists. And they're getting new revelations from God all the time. And those revelations don't agree with these. And so if you're not a cessationist, then you're not sure whether God has spoken or whether he's still speaking or whether there's some new revelation. And that's why Jesus said, watch out when someone tells you, lo, the Lord is over there, or lo, he's over here, or he's already come, or he's coming. Because he says, you won't know unless you believe that forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And so we are cessationists, and we believe God's word is complete. There's no more continuing revelation. There are no more apostles coming. There are no more prophets that speak the very revelation of God. Also, we are imputationists. You say, huh, is that for the American for Disabilities Act? I mean, what is that? Well, an imputationist is a person that believes that Jesus Christ totally, once and for all, paid the price for our sins, and that... Payment was imputed to us totally. You say, so what does that mean? Well, there are people that believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross, but you have to come to church every week and get a little kind of like a a little bit of insulin, and you have to have your shot every week dispensed by the church that will get you to heaven. And we don't believe that. We believe that Jesus paid it all once and for all on the cross, and his death in our place absolutely paid the price for our sin, and I will never have to answer to God for my sin. I will never be judged. Romans 8.1. There is now therefore no condemnation. Why? Because the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means that all of my sins that I ever will commit from birth till today and everything until I die, every bit of them were placed on Christ. And to him was imputed all of my sin and to me was imputed all of his righteousness. That's what we believe. That's what an imputationist is. The imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. So we'll never face the condemnation of God. Well, also, inerrantist, cessationist, imputationist, we're creationists. Why? Well, I'm going to share with you the dangers of not being a creationist, okay? Why are we creationists? Because we believe that God, in his word, has presented that he has created this universe from nothing. And he did that instantly. And he did that completely. And the Bible presents, if you just read it, he did that quite recently. He did it very recently. In fact, you kind of open the Bible in Genesis, and the words that begin this book are in the beginning. 
So that's the beginning of the universe, the beginning of everything we know about. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How did he do it? It says he spoke the worlds into existence. So he instantly created all things. Let me show you what I mean from the gospel by John chapter 1. In the beginning, God, God the eternal, the infinite, the all-sufficient one, created the universe that began at his command to exist. And there he created the heavens, that's the expanse of the universe that goes ever outward, that scientists have not yet fully comprehended how vast it is, yet he rolled it out in one word, and it all existed. And then he created this earth, which the more we study it, the more we look at it, the more incomprehensibly complex, intricate, And interconnected are all the biomes, all the different biospheres where life exists, all of the processes through which God causes this planet to just flawlessly function and produce a place for life to be. But God created this universe, and it says in John chapter 1 that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. That's why we believe that God created the world completely. He created all of it. He didn't spin off pieces and let it kind of turn into whatever it could turn into. He didn't make a big cloud of gas and then let it go for billions of years and have it make something. It says, look what it says in verse 3. All things were made through him. He personally made everything. We were in Rhode Island. I was talking to my friend that that builds the tridents, and then he's building the sea wolves, and that's done. Now they're building, I forget, the new one, he told me, the, the new submarine that has little submarines inside of it, and it's so super powerful and everything. And, and he told me again that every piece in that submarine, from the beginning as a block of metal till it's put in the submarine, has a signature of every Everyone that works on it put onto it. Well, the God that created this universe, more than some little $2 billion submarine, he put his signature everywhere. And it says, verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. So God personally, completely, instantly, at his word, they came into existence, we'll see in just a moment, He created this universe. But when did he do it? Well, if you just read the Bible, he did it instantly. The scriptures tell us that in six days he made the whole universe. Not six trillion years, not six billion years, not six million years, not six thousand years. He made it in six literal solar days. That's just what the Bible says. Now, you can choose to not believe that, but that's what the Bible says, and that's what Jesus believed, and that's what all the prophets believed, and that's what the apostles believed. And Jesus said... That nothing at the end of verse 3 was made without him. Nothing. Let's ask the Lord to open our hearts to understand his word. And I will explain to you why it's so important that we be creationists. Father in heaven, we're coming before the table of the creator of the universe. And you created us in your image and we fell from that into sin and became desperately wicked. And therefore you, the creator, had to invade time and space and take upon yourself a human body. And you had to live the perfect life to credit to our accounts, and then you had to die the perfect death to bear away the guilt and the shame and the load of our sin that was going to suffocate us and drown us in the lake of fire forever. And you took it away. I pray that we would understand how wonderful it is that you we believe, created this universe instantly by the word of your power, completely all things were made by you, and recently, in six days, you made the heavens and the earth. We love you this morning. I pray that this would be a sweet time of worshiping you at your table for the great sacrifice you made to redeem your creatures In Jesus, in your precious name we pray. Amen. Let's turn over the book of Acts. That's the next book to the right. You're in the Gospel by John. Turn to chapter 14. How important is creation? Well, it seems to be the content of the Gospel message when the apostles went out. We find in Acts 14 that when Paul approached pagan people, 
he gave them a creation message. Look at verse 15 of Acts 14, saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men. They were trying to sacrifice and worship the apostles. And he says, We're the same nature as you. We preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God. Who is the living God? Look at this. End of verse 15. Who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all the things that are in them. He says the living God is the creator God. He is the one who made the heavens and the earth. He made it all. He made the seas and all the creature in them. He personally created them. Turn to chapter 17. When he gets to a group of total pagan people that are total idolatrous pagans. Brilliant, but lost and in the dark. What message does he give them? Verse 24 of chapter 17. He says, the God who made the world and all things in it. That's the completeness. See, we part of being a creationist is that you believe that God completely made everything. He did not allow things to kind of go their own way through the process of, of chance and necessity and mutation and selection and isolation and death, which is the core of evolution. He completely made everything. He didn't let them kind of become something. He made them. He fashioned them. And we believe that he made them instantly. It says, at his word they came forth. At the word of the Lord the mountains came forth. At the word of the Lord the stars appeared. At the word of the Lord he spoke them into existence. That's the instantaneous creation. And then he did it recently. Why why did the Jews not have to be reminded of that? Because they already knew it. They believed the books of Moses. They believed that in didactic form, Genesis 1 and 2 present the teaching explanation of where we came from. So the pagans had to be brought up to speed. And that's why in verse 24 of chapter 17, he says, He made the world, all things in it. Why is that so important? Since he is Lord of heaven and earth. Only the one who made everything can be Lord of heaven and earth because they come from him. They don't come from chance. They don't come from mutation. They don't come from natural processes. They come from divine origination. Therefore, verse 24 says, he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. And then look at this. He, verse 27, if you seek after the Lord, this creator, and hope and grope for him, you'll find him. See, It's only if you reach out after that creator that you can find him. Well, look at Colossians. That's another letter. Keep going to the right. It goes Acts, Romans, then 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians chapter 1. Here's another thing that the scriptures tell us. Talking about Christ, Colossians 1 verse 16. For by him, that's by Jesus Christ, all things were created. That's We believe he completely created this universe, both in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have created have been created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. He holds everything together. That's what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that before the creation there was nothing, and God made everything from nothing. And he did that instantly, completely, and recently. Uh, Keep going past Colossians, past the Thessalonians to Hebrews chapter 1. It goes Colossians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews chapter 1. And look at verse 10. And you, Lord, in the beginning... That harkens back to Genesis 1.1. Laid the foundation of the earth. You didn't let it distill out of a gas cloud. You didn't let it slowly uh, precipitate out of some mass. He says, you personally laid the foundations of the earth. And the heavens are the work of your hands. Wow. How did that happen? Turn to chapter 11. See, it, all the way through, this is, this is cover to cover in the Bible. But Hebrews 11.3 tells us about the instantaneous nature of creation. And this is what it says, By faith we understand that the worlds, that's the cosmos, that's all that's out there, including where we stand and everything else out in the universe, the worlds were framed by the Word of God. He spoke and they were framed. He just spoke and they took form. He spoke as it says in Genesis 1.16, and the stars appeared. Remember I said that's an incredible verse. And he made the stars also. He just spoke them into existence and flung them out there, and they all took their spot in the universe astoundingly. 
but they were framed, verse 11, or verse 3 of chapter 11 says, by the word of God. And then he made them from nothing. Look at this. So that the things which are seen, that's the visible universe, were not made of things which are visible. He did not use matter that was in previously in existence that, that exploded out from somewhere and uh, distilled into something. He made everything from nothing. Instantly, completely, and recently. At least that's how the Bible presents it. Well, look at Revelation 14. How, how important is this? Well, this message that I'm sharing with you, Revelation 14 tells us, starting in verse 6, is what God calls the eternal gospel, the everlasting gospel, the gospel that is never to change, that will exist forever. The everlasting gospel. What is the content of the everlasting gospel? Well, at the height of the tribulation hour, when the whole world is is enmeshed, in fact, it's so bad, uh, before I read this, look, look at uh, chapter 16, verse 9. I want to show you how bad it is at this moment when it happens. Just And I'll come back to 14.6. Revelation 16.9. Men were scorched with a great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who had power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Look at verse 11. And they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. You see, these, these people, they're totally uh, unwilling to turn to God. Now, turn back to 14. Six. During this time, all these plagues are coming. This angel is flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. What is the everlasting gospel? To preach to those who dwell on the earth. When God gets to broadcast something to the planet audibly, uh, and they can hear it, what does he say? Well, to those who dwell on the earth, every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So it's every language, every ethnic group, every local uh, part of this globe. In a loud voice, this angel flying around the earth broadcast, kind of like a, 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 a satellite low earth orbit, only he's even lower, and he is loudly preaching. And this is what he's saying. Fear God. Wow, what does fear God mean? It means acknowledge that he is, and it means to respond to knowing that he's there. What is the last verse of Ecclesiastes? Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man, for God will bring every work into judgment, whether it be good or evil. Fear God. Okay, so we need to fear God. That means reverentially acknowledge he's there. Give glory to him. How do we glorify God? By, by acknowledging that, that he is worthy of our glory and that, that he is more important than we are and that we yield to him. He is our creator. That's all part of giving him glory. And look at this. For the hour of his judgment has come. And here's the last element God wants. He wants fear, he wants glory, and he wants worship. Worship him. Who do we worship? The one who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Fear, glorify, and worship your creator. That is the gospel. And and Paul says in Acts 17, if you will say, creator, I want to know you, that he will reveal himself. He will have his word come to you through a servant, through a messenger, through means God uses. He will bring the word to every creature that seeks after their creator. Well, thus we believe God created the world. He says it. We believe it. He created it by the word of his power. That means instantly. He fashioned everything. He Everything that exists, he put into existence. That means he made it completely. And we believe that he did it recently. Why do we believe that? Because he says in Exodus 20 and Exodus 33, again, that he made the earth in six days. Six days. He did it all. He did it in six solar days. He did it in six literal 24-hour days. He says it. In fact, I told you several weeks ago, God actually, with his own finger, wrote into stone that in six days he created the heaven. The only thing that we know God literally, with his own finger in stone, ever wrote was the creation account. That's how important it is. Well, what does the world present us? The atheistic formula. That is, that matter plus the factors of chance and necessity, mutation and selection and isolation and death plus a long time period makes for everything we see. The problem with that is that was proposed prior to supercomputers. And now with, with the computers that are able to do billions and trillions of calculations, they can actually project out 
chance over over great periods of time, and even with all the factors that, that are programmed in, with all those, there is not enough time in 12 to 14 billion years for chance to produce anything that we see. Nothing is possible by chance. And, and when evolution was propounded, of course, by Darwin, uh, which was laughed at, by all the scientists of his day, when this idea of the, the natural selection and, and the process of evolving upward, it went totally against the laws that have never changed since then of thermodynamics, that there's not one object in the universe that is going upward. Everything is actually, according to the second law, declining. And Darwin proposed this, and actually, when he presented his paper, he was ready to retreat from it because he knew no one would accept it. But there were enough people who wanted to get God out of the picture, they accepted it. And even though it's scientifically impossible, it's still accepted. Why? Just like Revelation 16 says, the hardness of people's hearts. Well, what have Christians done? And why is it so important to believe in biblical creationism? Well, Christians have added God to the evolutionary formula. They call it theistic evolution. They put God in. And what they do is, they say matter plus the evolutionary factors of chance and necessity and mutation and selection and isolation and death plus a long period of time plus God makes everything. But that's unacceptable because the Bible presents an instant, complete, and recent creation. And biblical creation is that before everything was God plus nothing. And at the instant of biblical creation, God created all things, Colossians 1.17 by the word of his power. In the theistic evolutionary system, God is not the omnipotent Lord of all things, whose word has to be taken seriously by all men. Rather, he's integrated into the evolutionary philosophy, and this leads to danger. What, what are the dangers of even slightly believing in evolutionary thought and, and, and not believing in the totally distinct biblical creationism? Well, the first danger is this. Without an instantaneous, complete, and recent creation, we are in danger of misrepresenting God's nature. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, let's look at the Creator, okay? The Gospel by Matthew, chapter 5. And I'm going to take you to about 20 verses real quick, and I want to show you something. Matthew 5, verse 48, the last verse of the fifth chapter, Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, you shall be perfect. This is a hope. Uh, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. What does that mean? Well, we will be like him, we'll see him as he is. And so someday we have this hope of heaven and being perfect and being free from the power and the penalty and ultimately the presence of sin. But what does it say God is? God is perfect. Okay? So the scripture, the Bible, reveals God to us as our Father in heaven who is absolutely perfect. That's what God is like. Secondly, he is holy. In fact, Isaiah 6 says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So the perfect God that Jesus talks about, Isaiah describes him as holy. Jeremiah adds this, and Jeremiah 32, 17 says, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great power, and thy outstretched arm, and nothing is too difficult. So he's omnipotent. So he's perfect. He's holy. He's omnipotent. Turn back near the end of your Bible to 1 John chapter 4. I'll give you a few more attributes of God to think about in this equation. Because we don't want our view of creation to misrepresent God's nature. We want to be having a proper view of God. And 1 John 4, verse 16 says, And we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. So the Apostle John tells us that God is love. Back up to chapter 1 of 1 John, verse 5. Secondly, he says, not only is he love, this is the message, 1 John 1, 5, we have heard from him and we announce to you, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Now back up to verses 1 and 2. It says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have beheld with our hands and handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. So God is love and light and life. And he's omnipotent and he's holy and he's perfect. Now, look at Genesis 1. This perfect God says something in verse 31. So the first book, we're looking at a lot of verses. Don't get lost. We'll, we'll keep finding more. 
Genesis 1, verse 31. Look what the absolutely perfect, absolutely holy, omnipotent God of love and light and life says about what he made. Okay? Genesis 1, 31. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. Someone asked me about two or three weeks ago, they said, when did Satan fall? Well, he has to fall after verse 31, because there's no evil in the universe in Genesis 1.31. So Satan and the demons and the world that, that the theistic evolutionists and the progressive creationists and, and the evolutionary people believe that has all these layers of, of bones and death and carnage and ghastly destruction, all that stuff could not have been here. Because God, who is perfect and holy and omnipotent and light and life and love, who never tells a lie, who knows all things, who can see everything, he looks at this planet and what he says is, it was good. No evil, no death, no destruction, no layers of, of destruction and death, nothing. Good. And... Keep turning to the right, Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Bible. Deuteronomy 32 has another word about this. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Chapter 32 talks about what God does. In verse 4, the Bible who reveals to us our Father in heaven who is absolutely perfect, Matthew 5, 48, who is holy, Isaiah 6, 3, who is omnipotent, Jeremiah 32, 17, who is light and life and love, 1 John 4 and 1, who created everything very good, Genesis 1, 31, also created everything perfectly. Look what it says in Deuteronomy 32, 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect. When God made this universe, it was perfect. It was perfect. It was not fallen. It was not spinning out of control. The devil was not blasting this place and and causing all kinds. In the creation, God made this universe perfectly. For all his ways are just, a God of faithfulness, without injustice, righteous, and upright is he. Well, the first danger of believing any form of evolutionary, whether, whether it's Progressive creationism, which means God progressively made the universe over long periods of time, or whether it's theistic evolution, which means God just made the initial blast and then stepped back and let it all kind of form into whatever, or just plain blatant atheistic evolution, all of them, those options, misrepresent the nature of God. All of them. And those evolutionary thoughts give a false representation of God's nature, Because all of them have death and ghastliness that is ascribed to the Creator in His creation. That the perfect, holy, omnipotent, light and life and love God said was good. And so either He was wrong in saying it was good, or He calls good evil and you can't trust Him, or He wasn't able to stop the evil that was present in His creation. But all of them misrepresent the nature of God, and we don't believe that. Secondly, if you want to turn now to the New Testament, 1 Corinthians, and we're about halfway through these verses, just, just a few more real quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Without the instantaneous, complete, and recent creation of the universe, we're in danger of our God becoming a God of the gaps. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, it means that, that there are parts of the universe he is not sovereign and Lord and omnipotent over. There are kind of these lapses. You know, people say, uh, like our, our president, they say, oh, he lapsed. You know, he's got these gaps in his life where he can't control himself. Or, or someone else say, I lapsed into that. We humanize God by saying he has these lapses or these gaps where he's not in control of the universe. And that's not the God that's presented to us because the Bible states that God is the prime cause of all things. What do I mean by that? Well, look at 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Yet for us, there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. 
What that means is that everything that is here and present, God directly created good. And then we know about the fall and Lucifer, that's Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, the rebellion, and how through sin coming to the human race, through Adam and Eve's sin, death spread throughout all things. We know about that. We don't know where this world that the evolutionists and the progressive creationists and the theistic evolutionists have, where all that was present at creation. We don't know about that. That's a God of the gaps. We believe in the God who is Lord over all, and everything exists at his command, his will, and his allowance through his decrees. And so we have to be very careful because we don't want our God to become the God of these lapses where things happen that are out of his control. Without the instantaneous, complete, and recent creation also, we are in danger of denying a very central biblical teaching. You're in 1 Corinthians. Turn to the right to 2 Timothy. It goes 1st, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, then Thessalonians, 1st, and now 2 Timothy, chapter 3. The entire Bible bears witness that we're dealing with a source of truth God authored. In other words, this book presents itself not as man's words, not as man's ideas, not as, as humanly devised ideas. We have in our hands a divinely authored book of truth. Okay, that's how the Bible represents itself. Look at 2 Timothy 3.16. It says, all scripture... That, that's the whole book in your hand, is inspired by God. God inspired the whole thing, including Genesis 1 and 2, Job 1, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, all these hard things that talk about this instantaneous, complete, and recent creation. All Scripture is inspired by God, and all is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. Okay? Now, turn back to chapter 5 of the Gospel by John, verse 39, John 5, 39. Jesus tells us his view of the Bible. He says, search the scriptures, John 5, 39, because you think in them you have eternal life, and it is these, that's all the scriptures, that bear witness of me. You know what Jesus was saying? He said the scriptures, now some of you might live down where we live. We are on 91st Street, and I watch them, and they're dump trucks, and they're working every day around the clock. You know, at night they got their lights on. What are they building? They're building a ramp up to meet... Uh, where those big pillars are, they're going to put a highway on there. And they're put, piling all this dirt down on the southwest uh, corner of, of 91st and 169, and they've got this ramp coming up like this. And that ramp of dirt is going to someday tie in, and they're going to build the highway on there. Do you know what the Old Testament is? It's the ramp, the indispensable ramp that leads to the New Testament. It's inextricably and, and inseparably connected to the new. You cannot say, ah, the Old Testament's got myths and fables and, you know, you can't believe all that. But we believe the New Testament. We want to go to heaven. We want to be saved. But we can't take the ramp. It's like the entrance ramp to the highway. It's part of the whole thing. And Jesus said, the Old Testament speaks of me. And so the Old Testament is the indispensable ramp that leads to the New Testament. It's an access road to the truth of the New Testament. Now listen. Thus, The back 39 books here, these books, the Old Testament, which contain the biblical creation account, cannot be regarded as myths, parables, or allegories. Why? Because they are presented as a historical report. Now, what do I mean by that? Well... In Genesis 1 and 2, we have biological facts, astronomical facts, anthropological facts that are given in a didactic, that's a teaching form. They are given in literal terms. God did this, spoke this, day one. God did this, spoke this, day two. That is a didactic historical report. It's not, you know, kind of a smoky, kind of, I wonder what that means thing. I mean, to the Jews, they just took it as verbatim. They believed in six days of creation. When all the Canaanites around them didn't believe that, when all the Egyptians around them didn't believe that, when all the Assyrians and the Babylonians and everyone else didn't believe that, they did. And that's the the context the Bible comes to us. Uh, Remember this? Turn back to Exodus chapter 20. 
Exodus 20. Remember I've mentioned this, that God wrote one part of this book personally. The only thing we know that the eternal, infinite God personally wrote with his own finger. And it says in Exodus 20, verse 8, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Verse 9, Six days you shall labor and do all your work. The seventh day is the Sabbath. Why? Verse 11, In six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the seas and all that is in them. God, not in Genesis 1 and 2, God in Exodus 20 reaffirms personally with his own hand that in six literal, historic, solar, 24-hour days quite recently, he made everything. You know what? It doesn't matter to me if every person in the faculty of every institution in the world doesn't believe that. It doesn't matter. Let God be true and all the faculty is a liar. Because the day is coming when the whole world is going to worship the false Christ. And so you might as well get used to being in the minority because the longer the world goes, the more we're going to be in a minority. And the one thing Satan wants to rob the church of is their certainty of their origin. Because if you are not sure where you originated, you will not be sure why you're here. And you certainly won't know where you're going You know, the three questions that every young person needs to know is their origin, their purpose, and their destiny. Origin, God, immediately, completely, and recently made all things for the purpose that we might glorify him, and our destiny is to serve him forever in heaven. And that shapes everything for us on this planet. Well, if we're not careful, we deny the centrality of the biblical teaching. Last thing I'd like to show you is uh, in Revelation, I mean in Romans chapter 7. Real quickly to Romans 7. Because without an instantaneous, complete, and recent creation, we're in danger of a loss of the way for finding God. Okay? And the way we, we, we find God is realizing our lostness. And if we do not believe in this creation account, then we don't understand the fall either. And the Bible describes us as being completely ensnared by sin because of Adam, the first human's fall. And it says in Romans 7, 18, For I know that nothing good dwells in me, in my flesh. For the wishing is present, but the doing good is not. Verse 19, The good I wish to do, I do not do. I practice very evil, I do not wish. How did we get to that state? Turn back to Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Just as through one man sin entered the world. Who was that one man? Verse 14. Death reigned from Adam. Jesus believed Adam was the first man. Paul believed Adam was the first man. Moses believed Adam was the first man. The early church believed Adam was the first human being that existed. And the Bible presents that event as a recent event. In Genesis 1, and he had a son... And that son had a son, and that son had a son, and the Bible charts them, and it shows that man kept declining, and we get to another man named Noah and the flood, and we get to another man, Abraham and the covenant, and all of those events in the Bible are presented as very recent. Well, what does that mean to us today? It means that we should worship our Creator and believe Him. He says, by my word... I instantly created this universe. He says, I personally framed everything that is. I completely made it. And the Creator Himself speaks to us and says, I did it in six days. Six days like that are in your week. And just like you work for six and rest the seventh, I made it in six and I rested the seventh. 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 Rested the